I, uh, when I came to Austin in 1989, I actually was a patient at the clinic once and have this memory of it being a place that was very safe, very dignified and respectful, and I've always carried that with me, even though I hadn't had much uh, opportunity to cross paths with the clinic. And so when Regina and some of the folks on the board asked me to come live with you for a few days and to reflect what it was that was special about the clinic, I said, get me as close as you can to what inspires you and let me, let me see what I can make of it. So this is the piece now that we created for the luncheon. And I want to thank people in the room that I'm seeing right now that were um, kind and bold enough to let me into the room with them and patience and, and close to what it is that's so special about this clinic. And I hope that you see something in this work that honors the remarkable and inspiring work that you do. I have a patient at the clinic. She's a dancer. She invites me, so I go to see her dance. And what I see is more than courageous. It's wholehearted. Every step is graceful. Every gesture has purpose. But behind the choreography, you see something else, something more primal than an artist could imagine, a truth that is part of her body. She has kidney stones. In the x-rays, you see crystal spikes cutting into her flesh. You see obstruction and inflammation. You can see why she is in constant pain. I give her ibuprofen. We treat infection with antibiotics. We manage. I've noticed this urgent curiosity we have about pain. We're eager to learn how people live with what hurts. We need to understand that if we can't cure suffering, we can at least make meaning from it. That's what I see when she dances. Pain, an invisible partner that lifts her and holds her as she points towards what we are seeking. And here's what's surreal. We could end her pain tomorrow. Extracorporeal electrolithoscripty, sound can pulverize kidney stones and send them on their way. It's modern medicine at its most graceful. But the machine's at the hospital, and to get in, you need insurance, and she doesn't have it. Her restaurant jobs don't offer any. She's too old for her parents' plan. Private coverage was expensive, and now it's too late. Apart from the pain, she's in remarkable health. She has this vitality that comes from purpose from doing what you were put on earth to do. That's what you see when she dances. When I worked in managed care, so many of the patients that I saw were dying from their work. Now, I've got some connections. I know the system. I can make calls on her behalf. It's risky, but you'd do it too if you'd seen her dance. Even if you know that it won't help, that we'll have to wait until things get worse until she has a crisis we can't ignore. She'll come to the ER vomiting, high fever, barely conscious, and they'll have to admit her because that's the law. Now, of course, there's another option, an option that many of my patients don't have. She could get a real job, one with benefits and coverage for pre-existing conditions. It seems like the reasonable thing to do. Never mind that a real job might not leave her time or energy for dancing. She should do what the rest of us do, right? But then, what would that cost her? What would that cost us? It would cost almost nothing to heal her. Beneath all the bills and paperwork, it would cost society almost nothing. So, maybe we don't want to heal her. That's all I can figure. Maybe there's a cost we don't talk about. Maybe we know that making meaning out of suffering is our most important work. Maybe we need proof that wholeheartedness is worth it. Maybe we need her to show us 
what to do. I've been vaccinating kids for 25 years. I've done this 50,000 times. So you are in good hands, little man. Yes, you are. See those people out in the waiting room? I help them survive. See that three-year-old, the scared one? He's next. Even that guy over in the corner, the one who's given me the looks, somebody gave him shots. But right now, little man, it's all about you. He suspects something. Don't you? Don't you? Now, watch the kitty on the wall. That clock is as old as I am. You notice the tail swings one way, the eyes go the other. You ever feel like that? Not you, little man. You are so happy, and you've got a chubby little leg. So let's dab some alcohol right here. Ooh, that's funny, isn't it? Funny. Okay, now watch the kitty. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, and there. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. Let's give you back to mama now. I'll see him again in six months. Six meses, okay? I hate deception. I never say it won't hurt, but you can lie without words. Reassuring sounds, caresses, distraction, Betrayal. I just taught that baby that you can't trust people. Look, I never doubt that what I do is important. Shots are instant and effective, and I never felt that way when I did health ed. You talk to people about the dangers of smoking and cholesterol, and they nod, and an hour later, they're having a cigarette in the parking lot at McDonald's. Shots matter. And now, I say, if you haven't seen a kid die of measles, you don't know how important this is. You'll be all for shots. It just shouldn't hurt. How old do you have to be before you understand that a lifetime worth of protection is worth a moment of pain? In a perfect world, that's when we'd get our shots. And here's three-year-old Mr. Lucas. Look at that face. He's getting tougher already. In another 20 years, he'll look like that guy in the corner. How are you this morning, Lucas? You wonder what his mother told him this time, how she gets him here. He watches her look at me, and he sees conspiracy. <laughs> no wonder he's screaming. OK, now, Lucas, watch the kitty, and it won't hurt so much. Of course I'm saving children's lives, but I'm also pricking their innocence. I'm inoculating them against all the cruel ways that life exploits blind faith. It's hard to watch, isn't it? The sound of anguish is supposed to move us, but you can't trust your instincts. In my job, you have to override sympathy to really love people. There, Lucas, it's over. You're safe. Someday, you'll understand. Do you think that's true? I tell myself that, but you wonder, do we really revisit these traumas with perspective and make peace with them? Or do we just scar on top of scar? Because if so, I'm just giving these kids one more thing to carry, something else they may never learn to let go. That man in the corner is coming over to us. I always have this moment of panic. You know, the sound of fear can unlock things. Trust me. I can handle it. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes, sir, may I help you? I recognize you. You gave me shots. You remember that? I don't remember much, but I recognized your voice. The shots, did they hurt? I don't remember the shots. I just remember your voice and the clock. You said, watch the kitty. <laughs> That's my wife over there. You're going to have a baby, a little girl. So we'll be coming to see you. You still have that clock? I do. 
<laughs> Believe it or not, I do. Somehow, things that matter manage to survive. As the board of a huge healthcare corporation, it's your job to protect our shareholders. As the CEO, it's my job to make sure we've got a competitive strategy. Our customers demand efficiency. They want the full range of treatments at the lowest possible cost. So we've scaled up with specialists and technology and systems that get people in and out and on with their lives. Unfortunately, our customers also want empathy. For some unknown reason, they want to feel like their doctor knows them. You know, it only takes two minutes for an expert clinician to diagnose an illness, but it takes 10 times that long for the typical patient to feel understood. And that's why we've got a healthcare crisis. You send someone to medical school and you give them a white coat and you've created an authority who can affirm people and validate them and absolve them, and that creates a bottleneck because people's demand for that is endless. So what we've got to deal with here is a situation where we got a problem to manage. And in this case, we tell the doctors, cut it short, keep people moving. Then the customers scream that we're taking the care out of health care. So we try to reason with them. We say, if you can just be more detached from your body, if you can just be more stoic and existential about things, if you can just treat your doctor less like a priest and more like a plumber, we can give you all the medicine you want at a price you can afford. But some people would rather wait in line and wreck our cost structure if it's their only route to someone who seems to care. Now we've got this unfortunate accumulation of evidence suggesting that people who feel like their doctors care actually get better faster. And that's creating a competitive threat from small-scale healthcare providers who specialize in empathy. You know the ones I'm talking about. These funky little clinics where people work late and everything runs over time and the waiting room looks like the third day of a family reunion. <laughs> Mostly, they are dealing with patients we don't want, but that could change because these people have passion and grit, they've got focus, and they've got a bedside manner that's delivering measurable results. So they could, if they find some way to scale this mess, give us a run for our money. And with all of our sunk investments, that's a risk we can't take. So let's stop telling patients that empathy doesn't matter, and let's give them what they really want, empathy and efficiency. Of course, it's an illusion. Our doctors don't have time to listen, but our computers do. And with superior information technology, we can mimic the sort of compassion and concern that a real person has. I call this scalable empathy. And it's better than listening. It's more like mind reading, and it's going to save our business. First, we develop an extensive file on every patient. Every provider you see enters relevant details into a file that's accessible from anywhere in the system. No more complaints that your specialist treats you like a body part. Your endocrinologist will ask about your sprained ankle and that cough you had last year. So people are going to feel like someone understands them. Plus, we've got bots crawling through cyberspace, <clears throat> through social networking sites, and credit card transactions, and police reports, and your web browser history, so we're going to know everything that you're too shy to share. We're going to ask you better questions. We're going to know why you're so stressed out. Next, we get the doctors off the front lines. We just completed an interesting experiment where we gave actors white coats and three minutes to study a script generated from a patient file, along with open-ended prompts like, how are you feeling? Tell me more about that. I'm so sorry. And the patients liked the actors better. They were more likely to follow their orders and less likely to sue them. Plus, Actors are cheaper than doctors. 
With this new setup, doctors stay secluded in a remote location, observing consultations via webcam and triggering diagnosis directly to the actors who talk to the patients. It's not even that radical, just more specialization to take advantage of scarce expertise. And there are even cheaper options out there on the horizon. At the robotics lab at A&M, they've created androids that can replicate, replicate human body language of empathy. <laughs> and the patients feel heard. Plus, in one experiment, patients got better health results when they moved from an analytical doctor on a tight schedule to an online consultation with an empathetic avatar, sort of a cross between Marcus Welby and Shrek. <laughs> so when you think about how eager people are for empathy, how much of it happens in their mind, how willing they are to suspend disbelief, how easy it is for us to replicate it. You wonder why we didn't think of this long ago it's going to save our business. Now, of course, there will always be people who would rather wait in line. People who feel like efficiency isn't urgent and human. People who feel like care ought to involve some kind of sacrifice in the soul. People who say that if there's a line, there's something worth waiting for. Well, if you need that, we can simulate that too. For the rest of us, Scalable empathy is the system we always wanted. So efficient, so streamlined, so profitable, so effortless that it's literally too good to be true. I used to think I could get better if I tried. Now it's too late. My friend says, come to her clinic. I say, it won't help. She says, you deserve better. I don't believe that. You don't understand, I say. She says, tell me. I say, it's history. It's chemical. This is who I am. You can't fix me. She says, she loves me. I don't believe that but I go with her anyway to this clinic. The doctor, he's a kid. He says, do you want to feel better? I say, I'm used to how I feel. He says, but do you want to feel better? I say, you don't understand. He says, tell me, but it's too late. I have the life I deserve. He says, when you're ready, we can help you feel better. The woman at the desk, wants me to pay. But I'm poor. Yes, she says, so what can you afford? I've got five dollars and I need two for the bus. Then you can pay three today so we can help others. So say what you want about me. I didn't get no free health care. My friend invites me to the patient support group. Why would I go to that? I don't like sick people. Instead, I go back to the doctor. Did you uh, take the medicine? Did you uh, walk? I did not. Do you want to feel better? There's nothing I can do. So why did you come back? You remind me of my son. What's he like? He laughed like you. What happened? It doesn't matter. So, you know how to love people. We need more of that. Look, take the medicine, walk, see what happens. It won't help. When you're ready, we can help you feel better. The woman wants me to pay. Why should I do that? Because if you don't pay, the doctor doesn't eat. Believe it or not, we got people worse off than you. See, no free ride for me. My friend says, that if you really listen to someone, you cast out their demons. Is that what happens at the patient support group? Come once, she says. I won't ask again. So we meet at her house, and we sit around a plate of vegetables and people talk. 
One guy lost weight. One guy quit smoking. Why am I here? And then they ask me, do you want to feel better? I'm used to how I feel. I have the life I deserve. And they say, think about your children. And I say, that's none of your business. Respect my dignity and leave me alone. And this lady says, look, unless you can afford gold-plated health insurance, mister, you can't afford to be that unsociable. You're coming to our clinic. You are our business. I don't like these people. They're nosy. <laughs> but you like the doctor. I like the doctor. Two weeks later, did you take the medicine? Did you walk? I can't walk that far. Nothing helps. I'm going to miss you. Oh, I'll come back. You can't come back if you won't try. We can't take space from other people who want to get better. You don't care. You're just like everyone else. Look, life is hard. We're in it together. When you're ready to feel better, you'll come back. The hell I will. So I go back to the patient group. The doctor won't see me again because I'm not getting better. You tell me, is that fair? What are you doing? I'm doing nothing because nothing helps. And then they say, we hear you. We've been there. But if you don't try, nothing changes. And if nothing changes, then they win. They. Who's they? The people who really don't care about you or any of us. People who want proof that compassion is just a waste of time and money. If you don't try, then the clinic looks bad and that hurts everybody. So maybe you don't care about yourself, but you still have the power to do something good or bad, to help people or hurt them. So do what the doctor says. I won't get better. You don't know till you try. So I decided to show them. I took the medicine. I walked two miles every day till I was sore all over. I'm gonna kill myself and it's their fault. <laughs> two weeks later, I go back to the doctor. You've lost five pounds. Your cholesterol is down. How do you feel? I'll tell you how I feel. I feel angry. I can do this. I can feel better. I deserve better. I'll show you. We'll show them.